The Second World War came to an end on September 2, 1945. The victorious powers, the Allies, called this moment Victory Over Japan Day, or more simply, VJ Day. For the United States, this was an event 45 months in the making. When the U.S. entered the Second World War in December 1941, the other Allies had insisted on a Europe-first strategy, forcing America to commit its immediately available military assets to overthrow Adolf Hitler's Third Reich. Eventually, on May 8, 1945, after sustaining hundreds of thousands of casualties, American forces helped bring Hitler's regime to its knees. That day, Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel signed the Instrument of Surrender in Berlin, inaugurating Victory in Europe Day, or VE Day. During that time, U.S. military forces had not been idle in the Pacific. For the past three years, American Navy, Marine, and Army forces had greatly reduced Japan's hold on the western rim of the Pacific Ocean. The Japanese had lost badly at such battles as Midway, Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Kwajalein, the Philippine Sea, the Marianas Islands, Peleliu, Leyte Gulf, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and many other countless engagements in between. By the summer of 1945, the Allies were ready to follow the next step in the strategy, an assault against Japan's home islands. On July 26th, the Allied leaders met at Potsdam to finalize the instrument of surrender used to end the war against the Empire of Japan. None of the Allied diplomats yet knew how long Japan might hold out, but in the event that Japanese leaders admitted their willingness to capitulate, they would have a document ready. The Potsdam ultimatum outlined fairly specific demands, which included removing Japan's civil and military leaders from power, mandating Allied military occupation of the home islands, enforcing complete disarmament of Japan's military forces, and granting jurisdiction to punish Japanese civil and military officials for war crimes. The Allies promised to end military reconstruction of post-war Japan once the Japanese people had constructed a democratic government that protected freedom of speech, religion, and thought, as well as fundamental human rights. But until the time when the Japanese could demonstrate that they had created a peaceful, responsible government, they would have to accept unconditional surrender. The Potsdam ultimatum stated bluntly, the alternative for Japan is prompt and utter destruction. Convincing the Japanese government to accept unconditional surrender was easier said than done, and American strategists did not know if the final stage of victory would involve an amphibious invasion, a naval blockade, a series of air raids, or a combination of the three. In the summer of 1945, the U.S. Navy's third fleet was off the shore of the home islands, ready to launch low-level strike planes from the decks of its aircraft carriers. Meanwhile, U.S. Army Air Forces launched high-altitude bombers from the Marianas Islands, unleashing an aggressive and highly controversial firebombing campaign against Japanese cities. Further, 14 U.S. divisions were readying themselves for X-Day, November 1, 1945, the start date for Operation Olympic, the invasion of Kyushu, the southern end of the Japanese home islands. After that, on March 1, 1946, the Allies planned to proceed with Operation Coronet, the invasion of Honshu, which earmarked at least 40 divisions for the initial landing. But before any of the amphibious operations could begin, President Harry Truman decided to deploy an experimental weapon, the atomic bomb, which had been tested for the first time on July 16, 1945, in a remote desert location in central New Mexico. Three weeks later, on August 6, a U.S. Army Air Force B-29 superfortress named the Enola Gay detonated a uranium fission bomb nicknamed Little Boy over the city of Hiroshima. Then, three days later, on August 9th, another B-29 called Boxcar detonated a plutonium implosion bomb nicknamed Fat Man over Nagasaki. Although statistics are hard to determine precisely, as many as 200,000 Japanese civilians and military personnel were killed by the explosion, or died of radiation poisoning in the months that followed. Truman's decision to utilize atomic weapons against Japanese civilians generated considerable controversy, 
both at the time of the bomb's deployment and ever since. But whether or not it was the right decision or even an ethical one, the use of the atomic bombs brought a swift end to the Pacific War. The deployment of the two atomic bombs had their desired effect. On August 14, 1945, Emperor Hirohito devised a capitulation message and announced it to his people. He said, in part, The enemy now possesses a new and terrible weapon with the power to destroy many innocent lives and do incalculable damage. Should we continue to fight, not only would it result in an ultimate collapse and obliteration of the Japanese nation, but also it would lead to the total extinction of human civilization. Such being the case, how are we to save the millions of our subjects, or to atone ourselves before the hallowed spirits of our imperial ancestors? This is the reason why we have ordered the acceptance of the provisions of the Joint Declaration of the Powers. With that, the U.S. Navy entered Tokyo Bay to receive the Emperor's delegation and bring the nightmare of the Second World War to a close. In the following videos, you will hear the words of participants who remembered the arrival of VJ Day. More than 75 years have since passed, so many of the witnesses to VJ Day have since passed on. But before they died, they left behind vivid accounts of their experiences. Voice actors will read aloud their words to bring these recollections back to life. These memories force us to pause and reflect upon the importance of the Navy's role in the Pacific War's conclusion.